let's now cross over to Johannesburg, South Africa, and talk to this gentleman. His name is Kennedy Otwombe. He's an associate professor, perinatal HIV research unit in the School of Public Health at the University of Witwatersrand. Good morning, Kennedy. Good morning, Eric, and everyone in the studio and Good. all your listeners. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for speaking Thank you. to us. Thank you. You, you live and work in South Africa. You are in Johannesburg. We know um, that the situation in South Africa has gotten to a point where the government has decided, look, mm -hmm. everybody stay indoors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are indoors. And um, today we are counting the eighth day. Uh, let's be honest. The last time I stepped out of a compound was eight days ago. Out of your compound? Mm -hmm out of the compound right i most of the time we're indoors and every other person is indoors so for example in the complex where we're staying you know the, the government doesn't even want um, neighbors to get together i yeah. mean the whole idea is to reduce interaction as much as possible yeah. um, hopefully um, that will also reduce the chance of infections mm. is this order being adhered to across the country from what you see in the news? Um, that's a very interesting question. Largely, yes, and especially in the suburbs. Uh, but I think there might be a bit of a challenge in the townships mm -hmm. and in the areas where there are sharks. And, you know, this is difficult because, you know, some of these people don't have a lot of space or a lot of room. Mm. Uh, you know, if you're living in a one-room um, unit, for example, yeah. And then you're told you have to be in a lockdown. You know, you can't even go out and jog. You, it's illegal. I mean, you can't take your dogs for a walk. I mean, if you try to do that, you might be arrested. So it is tough. Mm. And in some of those areas, it's a bit difficult to implement the policy. But, you know, nevertheless, people are trying. But I can tell you in the suburbs, it's extremely quiet. Mm. Mm. Is there a general comprehension of the need to do this vis-a-vis uh, -vis what could happen if they don't? Um, look, they need to do this. Uh, there is a fairly good understanding of the dangers of, of corona. But again, mm. just like it's happened in many other parts in, in Africa, there is people that don't really think corona is a very serious thing. Mm. And this message is being reinforced as much as possible. Mm. And... Um, I mean, a lot of, uh, I must be honest, a lot of the population in, in SS seems to have taken it a bit more seriously. Yeah. And um, uh, look, if you go out, there's really no movement. It's, it's, it's very surprising. Um, I haven't been out, as I say, but from one of my rooms upstairs, yeah. I yeah. can look outside and I literally don't see anyone. On Monday is the only time I took the dustbin out because garbage is collected on a Monday. And that's the only time I sort of saw a few neighbors outside taking their beans. But then after that, again, it all went quiet. Right. So did any of this change? I mean, because we saw one day we saw 120 cases in South Africa. The next day we saw 400. The day after that, literally, we were at 800. And today, almost 1,500. Did it change in uh, the way in which people did, um, did anything? And then was a lockdown welcome? Um, you know, from... A public health point of view and through a lot of consultation mm. it was thought that the lockdown would be the best solution given that um, if you go to the weekend just before the lockdown yeah I think we started that weekend with a total of 202 cases mm. on Saturday morning mm. yeah. but by Saturday evening the number had gone up to almost 300 by Sunday evening we were close to 500 yeah. and by I think Wednesday, we were way above that. And so what has since happened is yesterday the minister announced the, the numbers that uh, have been tested. And what is actually interesting is, though it's quite early, but the number of um, cases coming up are far much fewer than what we've seen earlier. Hmm. So it's early times, hmm. it's early days, but it does seem that there is you know, something happening. Looking at the response that uh, the government of South Africa has been has given to uh, this pandemic, do you feel that they have taken the right measures at the right time, or are there some measures that um, you feel 
they have beaten the curve or somewhere they have completely missed the point. Okay, so I'm going to talk about this more as a public health um, expert because, you know, my background is in biostatistics. Yes. So I'm going to look at this from an ep epidemiological point. You know, uh, I think the best way to control um, any further uh, spread of this disease is through a lockdown. Mm. But you see, a lockdown is also tricky because before a government announces that... Um, you know, they should go into a lockdown. There's many factors you need to take into place because it has a direct effect on the economy. Mm -hmm. And um, for South Africa, I think the biggest fear was, um, if you look at the guys who live in townships, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of congestion. Yep. And then there's a lot of people that use um, taxis, which is our equivalent of matatus. Yes. Now, without proper control measures, you can have this disease spread. Mm -hmm. And then additionally, Remember, South Africa has about 20.4% of the population that is HIV infected. So the biggest fear is if this corona interacts with HIV, we might get, you know, a way bigger impact. Mm -hmm. And so it's literally playing around the area of caution as opposed to just doing it for the sake of it. You work in the HIV field, uh, Kennedy, and... Uh our right. co-host here, C.T. Muga, has also worked in this field for a while. You're head of biostatistics unit at uh, Perinatal HIV Research uh, University, University of Witwatersrand. Now, having worked in this field and knowing that, uh, that this coronavirus is hitting hard, those with pre-existing conditions, HIV, you've got big numbers in South Africa, just like we have got big numbers in Kenya and other parts of Africa. How do you see um, the response of the government helping, especially those that are exposed, those, those that are vulnerable at this point? So these are the early days. And uh, as I said earlier, the fear is, you know, uh, the fear is should corona come, you know, into interaction with HIV, then it might be chaos. But the thing is, I think from evidence seen in Italy, the way people have died, yeah. and knowing that um, HIV reduces your immunity, it is very likely that, you know, should it um, land on people that are HIV infected, it's very likely that, you know, we might have high rates. Mm -hmm. And so what the government is currently doing is really trying to, uh, you know, put measures that are more preventative because um, you just don't want to get to that point because then it might just be more disastrous than we've seen even in Europe. Mm. Um, as it is now, um, I also think the other advantage um, South Africa and Africa has relative to what's been happening in Europe is I think in Africa we've had a lot of experience dealing with pandemics. You know, if it's not Ebola, it is cholera or it is typhoid. So I think our level of preparedness mm. is, is, is is pretty high. Mm. Um and like in a place like Europe, the US, where they have a lot of resources, but, you know, I don't think they're prepared for this sort of uh, pandemic. So for us, our weakness is, is our, our strength. strength. That's what I believe. <laughs> yeah. It is our strength. Professor, I'd, li I'd like to ask two questions. Let me start with the first one. Of the okay. numbers that we read in the papers, do you see a representation of these numbers in, say, some of the low-income residential areas within the country? Uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, one of the ministers the other day presented or talked about the numbers that, you know, have tested positive. And the very interesting thing is the spread of corona um, or corona cases seems to be actually high in high economic areas. Mm -hmm. Santon, for example, in, in Joburg, and Bedford View in, in Joburg, these are pretty high-end areas. That's where the hotbed lies. Right. And similarly in, in, in Cape Town. But, you know, you must also remember that a lot of the people that um, initially came with coronavirus are people that had flown in from out of the country. And ideally, this would be people who are, you know, better off financially and uh, can afford to go for trips. Like the first case was a group of people that 
had gone to Italy for a holiday mm -hmm. and then came back in a group of 10. I mean, these are not uh, things that a lot of poor people can afford. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why, actually, the rates seem much higher in high socioeconomic groups and not low socioeconomic groups. And if you were to look at, say, the response that people have towards uh, this particular pandemic, would you say that they understand the severity of it? I think people are beginning to understand the severity. Initially, it was slow, but I think people are beginning to understand the severity of it because, you know, like two days ago, we lost one of our top HIV researchers in the country mm. um, to COVID. And, you know, this is a person that was pretty much aware of it and, you know, had tried the best to even seek treatment, but, you know, it's just what, it is. So I think now people are beginning to understand the severity of it. Initially, it was a bit slow. There was all talk that, you know, we in Africa cannot get it, but, you know, it's it's just not the case. It is happening now. It is hitting everyone. Indeed. Part B of my question, that was part A. If you, well, you okay. are a biostatistician, so if you look at, say, the care-seeking behavior of most of the people who live in the, should you say, the lower-income residential areas, do you think that their care-seeking behavior would help them fight this virus, or do you think it would actually worsen the situation? So the biggest fear is, and that's why awareness is being created amongst them, because generally speaking, um, you know, a lot of them would be people that sit care in public health care facilities, but again, many of them are people who present to hospital when, you know, their cases are a bit advanced. So based on their healthcare seeking behaviors, um, it would be extremely dangerous if it gets down to low um, socioeconomic groups because away from the health seeking uh, away from the health seeking behavior, it's just that you know they also live in pop in highly densely populated areas, mm -hmm. and that is a risk factor for increased transmission. Mm. Professor Kennedy Otombe from uh, the University of Witwatersrand Rand in South Africa, thank you very much for speaking to us. Thank you so much for having me. We are glad to keep you busy. Uh, at least we know <laughs> that you're, you're now in lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> I am in lockdown, but uh, fortunately for the nature of work that I do, I, I can work from home. You're still working. And so I am still working. I actually work even longer hours because, you know, you wake up and seven o'clock on your computer and, and that's and all you do <laughs> and 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 listening and watching the situation room in the background <laughs> yes <laughs> and, and reporting numbers and reporting numbers i'm doing some projections now for something on on coffee and it's, it's quite interesting great as Thanks we come so to the top the of the hour and say goodbye to you we'd like uh, ct muga to tell you our african proverb of the day the best way to okay. eat an elephant standing in your path is to cut it up into little pieces Get that, Prof? Yes. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> Asante, Sanan. Have Thanks a good day. So thank you. All right. You too. You too. Thank you all. Asante.